Hello everyone, and welcome to this episode of This is Islam. I'm Kai, and in today's episode we look at the forgotten Qur'an, namely that the Qur'an has not been perfectly preserved. I will examine seven specific points. That Muhammad himself forgot the Qur'an, the concept of abrogation and parts of the Qur'an that we know have not been preserved, the seven so-called Ahruf, Ibn Masud's copy of the Qur'an, Ubay ibn Kab doubting Muhammad's prophethood, and the epistemic problem with regards to claims of perfect preservation. The title of Book 6, Chapter 33 in Sahih Muslim with regards to travelers' prayers is, quote, Chapter, The Command to Keep Refreshing One's Knowledge of the Qur'an and that it is disliked to say, I have forgotten such and such a verse, but it is permissible to say, I have been caused to forget. End quote. So the theme of the hadiths found in this chapter center around the idea that one must be diligent in practicing recitation of the Qur'an in order not to forget it. Take, for example, the following three hadiths. Quote, Aisha reported that the Messenger of Allah heard a person reciting the Qur'an at night. Upon this he said, May Allah show mercy to him. He has reminded me of such and such a verse which I had missed in such and such a surah. End quote. Quote, Aisha reported that the Messenger of Allah listened to the recitation of the Qur'an by a man in the mosque. Thereupon he said, May Allah have mercy upon him. He reminded me of the verse which I had been made to forget. End quote. Quote, Abdullah reported Allah's Messenger as saying, What a wretched person is he amongst them who says, I have forgotten such and such a verse. He should instead of using this expression say, I have been made to forget it. Try to remember the Qur'an, for it is more apt to escape from men's minds than a hobbled camel. End quote. In other words, these hadiths are proof that Muhammad himself forgot the Qur'an. To get a more detailed perspective, let's take a look at Imam Nawawi's commentary to these hadiths. Quote, The fact that the Prophet said, a verse which I was made to forget, shows that the Prophet could forget something that he had delivered to his community. We mentioned when we spoke about prostration to rectify errors in prayer, the areas where the Prophet could forget things and those where he could not. Qadi Yad said, The majority of meticulous scholars agree that the Prophet might forget something that was not part of what he needed to deliver of his message. As for what he needed to deliver and teach, their views differed. Those who said that he could forget added that he would not be left in that condition. He would be reminded or he would remember. They further differed as to whether the reminder or the remembrance would be immediate or at some later time, but before his death. Forgetting what he had already delivered, as in this hadith, is possible. We have already discussed how the Prophet forgot during his prayer. Some Sufis and their followers have claimed that forgetfulness did not apply to him in anything whatsoever, but it might have occurred in form only. This is a clear contradiction, which is unacceptable. No scholar worthy of name said it except Abul Muzaffar Shakfur al Isfarayini, a prominent Shafi'i scholar who leaned towards this view. It remains unsupportable and self contradictory. End quote. Imam Nawawi's commentary is crucial because it directly refutes the idea that some Muslims put forward that quote unquote forgetting or cause to be forgotten is to be understood as having been abrogated, the idea of which is found in the Quran itself, namely Surah 2, verse 106. Quote, We do not abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten except that we bring forth one better than it or similar to it. Do you not know that Allah is over all things competent? End quote. There are several reasons why it is nonsensical to use this verse of the Qur'an to advance the case that forgetting is meant to be understood as abrogation in the previously mentioned hadiths. 1. Abrogation can be of verses within the Qur'an, but it can also mean abrogation of previous revelation, example the Torah for which see Ibn Kathir's commentary to Surah 2, verse 106. Moreover, there is nothing in the hadiths themselves to suggest abrogation of any kind. 2. 
The hadiths in Sahih Muslim make it clear that abrogation is not synonymous with forgetting in this context. 3. We know from Sahih Muslim and Imam Nawawi's commentary that the context is about stressing the importance of revising one's memorization of the Qur'an in order not to forget it. It makes no sense to revise something that was abrogated. 4. If something was abrogated, then that would have been immediately communicated to the Sahaba, meaning that they would no longer recite that which was abrogated. If Muhammad failed to inform his Sahaba of what was abrogated, then he failed as a prophet. The whole point of Muhammad being a messenger is to deliver the message. So if you have people continuing to recite something that is abrogated in the sense that the verse is no longer part of the Qur'an, then that's a failure to deliver the message. A Muslim reciting such an abrogated verse is not any different to Jews and Christians reciting the so-called abrogated Torah and Gospel. This now leads into the next point of the presentation, known verses that have been abrogated and lost parts of the Qur'an. For example, why are abrogated verses preserved in the Qur'an? Examples are Surah 2 verse 62, Surah 33 verse 52, and Surah 24 verse 3, among many others. Why would the final revelation to all of mankind, a perfect book, need abrogated content to confuse its readers? This then begs the question, why preserve only some abrogated verses and not others? Furthermore, why not preserve verses that actually were not abrogated? For example, consider this hadith from Sahih Muslim. Quote, Aisha, Allah be pleased with her, reported that it had been revealed in the Holy Quran that ten clear sucklings make the marriage unlawful. Then it was abrogated and substituted by five sucklings, and Allah's apostle died, and it was before that time found in the Holy Quran and recited by the Muslims. End quote. Also consider another hadith from Sahih Muslim. Quote, Abdullah bin Abbas reported that Umar bin Khattab sat on the pulpit of Allah's messenger and said, Verily, Allah sent Muhammad with truth and he sent down the book upon him. And the verse of stoning was included in what was sent down to him. We recited it, retained it in our memory, and understood it. Allah's messenger awarded the punishment of stoning to death to the married adulterer and adulteress. And after him, we also awarded the punishment of stoning I am afraid that with the lapse of time, the people may forget it and may say, we do not find the punishment of stoning in the book of Allah and thus go astray by abandoning this duty prescribed by Allah. Stoning is a duty laid down in Allah's book for married men and women who commit adultery when proof is established or if there is pregnancy or a confession. End quote. As for the three abrogated verses I mentioned, we know for a fact that they were abrogated. From Reliance of the Traveler, there is clear expression that Surah 3, verse 45, abrogates Surah 2, verse 62. Quote, Previously revealed religions were valid in their own eras, as is attested to by many verses of the Holy Quran, but were abrogated by the universal message of Islam, as is equally attested to by many verses of the Quran. Both points are worthy of attention from English-speaking Muslims who are occasionally exposed to erroneous theories advanced by some teachers and Qur'an translators affirming these religions' validity but denying or not mentioning their abrogation, or that it is unbelief, kufr, to hold that the remnant cults now bearing the names of formerly valid religions, such as Christianity or Judaism, are acceptable to Allah Most High after He has sent the final messenger, Allah bless him, give him peace, to the entire world. This is a matter over which there is no disagreement among Islamic scholars, and if English-speaking Muslims at times discuss it as if there were some questions about it, the only reason can be that no one has yet offered them a translation of a scholarly Quranic exegesis, tafsir, to explain the accord between the various Quranic verses and their agreement with the Sunnah. End quote. Musa Ferber shares with us the abrogation of Surah 24, verse 3, by verse 32. Quote, the legal foundations for marriage, nikah, is from the Quran, Sunnah, and consensus. 
among the evidence establishing it is Allah Most High saying, Marry of the women who seem good to you. Surah 4 verse 3 And, and marry such of you as are solitary. Surah 24 verse 32 The second verse, Surah 24 verse 32, is said to abrogate The fornicator shall not marry save an adulteress or a fornicator. Surah 24 verse 3 End quote. Similarly, verse 50 of Surah 33 abrogates verse 52 of the same Surah. Quote, Allah Most High says, It is not allowed thee to take other women henceforth, nor that thou shouldest change them for other wives. Surah 33 verse 52. This was abrogated with the verse where Allah Most High says, O Prophet, lo, we have made lawful unto thee thy wives unto whom thou hast paid their dowries. Surah 33 verse 50. End quote. Notice how a verse that appears earlier in the surah abrogates that which appears two verses later. Right. That's not at all confusing because it makes so much logical sense to just randomly put the abrogating verse immediately before the abrogated verse with no hint of which abrogates which. Now, the anticipated Muslim response is that there are three kinds of abrogations, namely, one, that which has been abrogated in both recitation and jurisprudence, so it no longer exists in the Qur'an, and there are no valid jurisprudential rulings with regards to it. Two, abrogation of recitation, but not jurisprudence, meaning that the ruling still holds despite not being found in the Qur'an. And three, no abrogation in terms of recitation, but abrogation in terms of jurisprudence. So it is still in the Qur'an, but is not to be taken into account in matters of jurisprudence. Utilizing this categorization scheme, for example, Muslims would classify the ten sucklings in the first category, but the five sucklings would be classified in the second category. However, this is problematic for Muslims because Aisha clearly and unambiguously states that the suckling verses were explicitly in the Qur'an, meaning they were removed or lost at some point. The only way around this problem for Muslims is to claim that knowledge of its abrogation did not reach everyone before Muhammad died. In other words, if Muslims want to go this route, then they are admitting that Muhammad failed to deliver the message, meaning he failed as a prophet. And the same kind of analysis can be given with regards to the verses concerning stoning. The presence of seemingly random assortment of abrogated verses, abrogating verses haphazardly juxtaposed next to abrogated verses with no hint which verse abrogates which, ad hoc explanations why some abrogated verses no longer appear in the Qur'an while others that are connected to still legally binding jurisprudential rulings do not, all suggest lack of perfect preservation. If you are Muslim, then ask yourself the following question. Where is the logic in keeping abrogated verses in the Qur'an, verses that are no longer applicable, yet leave out verses which are connected to valid jurisprudential rulings. I understand that you have the threefold categorization scheme. What I'm saying is that scheme makes absolutely no sense, especially for the supposed final religion to all of mankind. Moving on to the next section of the presentation, the seven ahruf frequently referred to as the seven pronunciations. From Imam Nawawi's commentary to Sahih Muslim, quote, The Prophet says, This Qur'an has been revealed in seven ways of pronunciation, i.e. harfs, recited as you find easy. Scholars say that the reason for revealing it in seven ways was to make it easier for people. Hence, the Prophet made his appeal to God as stated in Hadith number 1626, please make it easier for my community. Scholars differed as to what seven harfs meant. Khadi Iyad said, it is said that it is to make an allowance that would ensure its being easier to recite. It is not intended as seven only. The majority of scholars said that the number is definitely seven, 
not more. It is also said that these were seven in meaning, such as promise or warning, precise or equivocal, permissible or forbidden, stories, similes, orders and prohibitions. Further, scholars differ in their selections of seven. Others said that it relates to how recitation is made and how individual words are pronounced. What applies to them of assimilation, realization, valorization, diphthongization, and elongation? Arabic dialects differed in such aspects of pronunciation. Therefore, God made it easier for them so that everyone could recite the Qur'an according to what they were used to in their own dialects. Other scholars said that it refers to words and sounds. This is what Ibn Shihab refers to as he is quoted by Muslim in Hadith number 1625. These scholars also differ with some saying that the term refers to seven variants and possibilities. Abu Ubaid said it refers to seven Arabic tongues, Yemeni and Ma'idi. And these are the most eloquent of Arabic dialects. It is further said that all seven harfs belong to the major tribe of Mudar, and they are all used in the Qur'an and cannot be grouped together in one word. Some say that they are found together in some words, such as those who worship false gods, in Surah 5 verse 60. Our Lord, make our journeys longer, Surah 34 verse 19. He may enjoy himself and play, Surah 12 verse 12. Dreadful suffering, Surah 7 verse 165, and similar ones. Qadi Abu Bakr al-Baqilani said, The correct view is that these seven ways of pronunciation were well known and widely used as taught by the Prophet. Scholars received them accurately, and Uthman and his scribes recorded them in the master copies of the Qur'an, stating their authenticity. They only left out what was not proven to be of the recurrent, i.e. mutawatir grade of authenticity. These harfs may differ in meaning at times and in pronunciation at other times, but they do not conflict and are not mutually exclusive. Atahawi said that recitation of the Qur'an in the seven ways of pronunciation was particularly needed during the early period because of the different Arabic dialects and the difficulty of imposing one way of pronunciation on all groups at the outset. When the numbers of people and scribes increased and the necessity was no longer felt, only one way of pronunciation was retained. Al-Dawudi said the seven variant readings, i.e. Qur'at, which people used in their recitations today, do not correspond to the seven ways of pronunciation, in the sense that each variant represents one harf, or way of pronunciation. They may be spread in all of them. Abu Ubaidullah ibn Abi Sufra said, these seven Qur'at, or variant readings, belong to one of the seven ways of pronunciation mentioned in the Hadith. This is the harf Uthman used in the master copy of the Qur'an. This is what is stated by An-Nahas and other scholars. Other scholars said, it is not possible to use the seven harfs mentioned in the Hadith in reciting the Qur'an once from start to finish. Nor is it known which of the variant readings, or Qara'at, was the one used the last time the Prophet recited the Qur'an to Gabriel. All of these are widely learned from the Prophet and were meticulously learned and taught within the Muslim community. Every one of them was attributed to the Prophet's companion who used it most. Moreover, every one of the seven Qara'at is attributed to one of the seven main reciters who taught it. Imam al-Mazari said, the view that what is meant is seven different meanings, such as rulings, similes, stories, etc., is wrong. The Prophet, peace be upon him, pointed out that it is permissible to recite the Qur'an using every one of the seven ways of pronunciation and to replace one by another. It is well established that it is absolutely forbidden for a verse citing a simile to be replaced by one stating a ruling, etc. Moreover, it is wrong to claim that the hadith refers to the endings of verses, such as replacing an ending stating, God is much forgiving, ever merciful, by one that says, God hears all and knows all. Again, the Muslim community is unanimous that no change is permissible in the Qur'an. End quote. 
And then we get into a bit of mental gymnastics. Quote, in number 1628, we have a different narration by Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shaiba stating that the Prophet was first required to recite the Qur'an in one way of pronunciation, and this was made two ways the second time, and three the third time, then the seven ways of pronunciation were granted the fourth time. This may be problematic, particularly in reconciling the two texts. The easiest way to reconcile them is to say that when in the first narration it is stated, he came back to me the third time to recite the Qur'an in seven ways of pronunciation, the third, in this instance, means the last, which actually was the fourth. Thus, it is called the third figuratively. What encourages this understanding is that the second narration clearly states that the seven pronunciations were granted the fourth time, which was the last. This understanding of the hadith supposes that the first narrations overlook some of the requests. End quote. Follow the logic. Third means last, but is actually fourth. But getting back on track, summarizing the issues with regards to the seven akhruf. One, Muslims do not know what the seven akhruf actually are. Muslims may know or speculate the function of the akhruf, but they do not know what the akhruf actually are. Two, Muslims cannot conclusively demonstrate what the Uthmanic manuscript looked like. The current 1924 Cairo edition of the Qur'an, which is the most popular version worldwide, is not the original Uthmanic text. 3. Nawawi states on the authority of Bakalani that the seven Ahruf were preserved in the Uthmanic manuscript, yet Tahawi says that over time only one harf was retained. So do Muslims have all seven akhruf or just one harf? Is the original Uthmanic text preserved or was it lost? 4. Muslims boast about how well they have memorized and preserved the Qur'an as a community through oral transmission. In that case, it is reasonable to expect the seven akhruf to have been preserved by the Muslim community irrespective of manuscript texts. Where are the seven akhruf? 5. If Muslims cannot preserve something as integral as the akhruf, or even knowledge about what the akhruf are beyond just vague statements and conjecture, then why believe the claim that they were able to preserve the Qur'an perfectly? The akhruf are integral to the Qur'an, yet Muslims talk about them using vague statements and conjectures. This all now leads us into the first variation of the perfect preservation dilemma for Muslims. If you claim the Qur'an is perfectly preserved, then it means you know the seven akhruf. However, since you are not 100% certain what an akhruf even is, and admit that you might not have preserved all the akhruf, then you cannot justify the claim that the Qur'an is perfectly preserved. The perfect preservation dilemma can also be cast in a different way as a follow-up to the first version. If preservation of a single harf means the Qur'an is perfectly preserved, i.e. it is not necessary to have all seven akhruf in order to claim perfect preservation, then it is the meaning of the revelation that must be used as the determiner for the claim of perfect preservation. In that case, Muslims cannot accuse Christians of having corrupt scripture if manuscript variations do not alter the underlying meaning. Moving on to the next section of the presentation, Ibn Masood. He was one of the most well-respected of the Sahaba and highly qualified to speak on Islam. From Reliance of the Traveler, quote, A second aspect is the consensus of scholars that the companions of the Prophet, Sahaba, anyone who personally met the Prophet, Allah bless him and give him peace, and died while believing in Islam, were at various levels of knowledge in religion. Not all of them were capable of giving formal legal opinion, fatwa 
as Ibn Khaldun has noted, nor was the religion taken from all of them. Rather, there were those of them capable of legal opinion and ijtihad, and these were a small minority in relation to the rest. And there were those of them who sought legal opinion and followed others therein, and these were the vast majority of them. Suyuti, in Tadriba Rawim, quotes Ibn Hazm's report that most of the companions' legal opinions came from only seven of them, Umar, Ali, Ibn Masud, Ibn Umar, Ibn Abbas, Zayd ibn Thabit, and Aisha. And this was from thousands of the companions. End quote. Nonetheless, he was at odds with other Sahaba and even had a different version of the Quran. Imam Nawawi's commentary on Sahih Muslim. Quote, in Hadith number 1617, the Prophet says, have you not seen that tonight certain verses have been revealed the like of which have never been known? They are the surahs starting with, Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of the daybreak, and Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of mankind. This shows the great importance of these two surahs. We have already mentioned the difference of views among scholars regarding whether any part of the Quran is considered greater than other parts. This hadith provides clear evidence that these two surahs are part of the Quran. It refutes the claim attributed to Abdullah ibn Masud, stating something different is said. The hadith also proves that the word say is included in the Quran as the first word of each of these two surahs. The Muslim community is unanimous that this is so. End quote. And also the following. Quote, These hadiths mention that Abdullah ibn Masud and Abu al-Darda recited this surah stating, and by the male and the female while it is in the Qur'an, by him who created the male and female. Qadiyyad said that al-Mazari said, this report and other similar ones must be understood so as to believe that this was how the Qur'an was, but subsequently abrogated. It is not known that anyone held any view other than such abrogation, and thus the latest version remained. He added that, Perhaps some of these reports took place before they were aware of Uthman's standard version that was unanimously approved. It is unlikely that anyone contradicted it. There are many reports attributed to Ibn Masud, and some of these are considered as not authentic by scholars who verify reports. Whatever is authentic of these reports and contradicts what we have said is taken to mean that he used to write in his copy of the Qur'an some rulings and interpretations, knowing that they were not part of the Qur'an. He did not believe that it was forbidden to do so. He treated it as a scroll in which he could write whatever he wanted. Uthman and the majority of the Prophet's companions disapproved of this, fearing that with the passage of time, some may come to think that such writings were part of the Qur'an. Thus, the controversy focuses on a point of fiqh, namely, is it permissible to add some interpretation in a copy of the Qur'an? It is probable that the report that the last two surahs were not included in Ibn Masud's copy was due to his belief that he was not required to write the entire Qur'an and that he left them out because they were universally known. He might have added something other than the Qur'an instead, but God knows best. End quote. Now, the following does not make sense in the Muslim position. If the Qur'an was predominantly transmitted orally by memory from generation to generation, then why the concern for what was written down in manuscript form? If the transmission of the Qur'an is widespread and primarily oral, then people would be able to easily identify what is part of the Qur'an and what is not part of the Qur'an in manuscript form. That Ibn Masud left out Surah 113 and Surah 114 on the basis that they were widely known is a cope it actually attests to the fact that it ultimately does not matter what was written in manuscripts if everyone knew what made up the Qur'an and what did not. The Muslim argument is basically that one should write down only the Qur'an, but that it's okay not to write certain parts down, especially because they are well known. Such a sentiment is perfectly fine if one wants to emphasize the sacredness of the Qur'an. But the commentary is concerned with regards to mixing text of the Qur'an with that which is not the Qur'an. 
this concern does not make sense given that the Qur'an is well known. It would be like saying that no Qur'an can be printed today with any commentaries for fear that people will mix up the commentaries and mistake them for the Qur'an itself. We also see hints that Ibn Masud disregarded Uthman's standardization efforts, despite the claim that such reports are falsely attributed to Ibn Masud. We know that Ibn Masud accepted Islam very early on, well before Muhammad's Hijrah, and was a personal servant to Muhammad. He was one of seven mujtahids universally recognized among the Sahaba as being an authority on the Qur'an. His Qur'an version, which he kept despite Uthman's standardization, on the whole was significantly different to the Uthmanic text containing copious amounts of variants, for which see materials for the history of the text of the Qur'an, the old codices, the Kitab al-Masahif of Ibn Abi Dawud, together with the collection of the variant readings from the codices of Ibn Masud, Ubay, Ali, Ibn Abbas, Anas, Abu Musha, and other early Qur'anic authorities which present a type of text anterior to that of the canonical text of Uthman which is edited by Arthur Jeffrey and published by Leyden, uh, E.J. Brill, in 1937. Ibn Masud's version of the Qur'an was widely known, embraced, and used in Kufa. And Muslim sources minimize, explain away, remain silent, or outright deny the well-known serious discrepancies that existed between Ibn Masud's copy of the Qur'an and Uthman's as well as the historical conflict between Ibn Masud and Uthman personally. Ibn Masud's case presents two dilemmas for perfect preservation of the Qur'an, both centering on the fundamental question of whether or not Ibn Masud's Qur'an was correct or corrupt. The first of the dilemmas is as follows. If Ibn Masud's Qur'an was correct, then Uthman... Islam's third so-called rightly guided caliph, explicitly destroyed legitimate divine revelation that was given to Muhammad and punished people for following what Allah revealed. On the other hand, if Ibn Masud's Qur'an was corrupt, then the Muslim Ummah followed a mujtahid that did not teach proper Islam. The second of the dilemmas is as follows. If Ibn Masud's Qur'an was correct, then mere textual variations in manuscripts cannot be considered quote-unquote corruptions, meaning Muslims cannot critique Christians on the sole grounds that just because there are textual variations in biblical manuscripts, that this means the texts are quote-unquote corrupt. On the other hand, if Ibn Masud's Qur'an was corrupt, then today's 1924 Cairo edition of the Qur'an, which is the most popular text of the Qur'an in the world today among Muslims, also needs to be considered corrupt by the same standard. So the case of Ibn Masud is very problematic for Muslims who want to claim that the Qur'an has been perfectly preserved. Moving on to Ubay bin Kab. This individual not only presents a serious problem to the Muslim claim of perfect preservation, but his situation challenges the entire validity of Islam itself, as I'll demonstrate. The first thing to understand is the high stature that Ubay had of all the Sahaba. He was the top Qur'an reciter, following only behind Muhammad himself, and was also a leading scholar in teaching the Qur'an. Consider this hadith from Sahih Muslim. Quote, Hadab ibn Khalid narrated, Hamam narrated, Qatada narrated from Anas ibn Malik that God's messenger, peace be upon him, said to Ubay, God has commanded me to recite to you. Ubay said, Has God named me to you? The Prophet said, God has named you to me. Ubay was in tears. End quote. Now consider this commentary by Imam Nawawi. Quote, This hadith gives us several very interesting points. One of these is the desirability to recite the Qur'an before people who excel in its recitation, 
even when the one who is reciting is better and of a higher status than the one who is listening. Another point is the special status given to Ubay ibn Kab, as the Prophet recited the Qur'an to him. It is not known that anyone else held the same status as Ubay. Another point of excellence given to Ubay is that God named him as deserving this superior status. A further point is shedding tears of joy when one is given very happy news. In Hadith number 1594, Ubay asks the Prophet, Has God named me to you? The question suggests that it might have been that God ordered the Prophet to recite the Qur'an to a person in his community without naming Ubay. Ubay wanted to make sure whether he was named specifically or just that any man was mentioned. This tells us that it is better to make sure when different possibilities may be suggested. Scholars differ as to the reason for the Prophet's recitation to Ubay. The preferred view is that it sets an example encouraging recitation before those who are known to be excellent in the Qur'an. Moreover, the Muslim community thus learns the manners to be observed when reciting the Qur'an. No one should disdain to do so. It is also suggested that the order to the Prophet was to indicate Ubay's high status and his being worthy of learning from. In fact, after the Prophet, Ubay ibn Kab was the leading scholar or one of the leading scholars in teaching the Qur'an. End quote. When the Caliph Umar established congregational tarawih prayers, i.e. the nightly congregational prayers during the month of Ramadan, where at least one Jews or a thirtieth of the Qur'an is recited each night, thereby completing recitation of the entire Qur'an during Ramadan, he appointed Ubay to lead the prayers. Quote, Hadith number 1515 mentions, The matter, Tarawih, was such until God's Messenger, peace be upon him, passed away, then it continued such during Abu Bakr's reign and for part of Umar's reign. This means that everyone offered the night prayer during Ramadan at his own home and this continued for some time into Umar's reign. Umar then organized the prayer in a congregation and appointed Ubay ibn Kaab to lead the prayer. It has continued to be offered in congregation ever since. End quote. Despite his high stature, there is also something quite striking with regards to Ubay. He doubted Muhammad's prophethood when Muhammad approved different recitations or pronunciations. Though Muslims attempt to minimize the event, Ubay's doubt was serious enough for Muhammad to physically assault him. From Sahih Muslim, quote, Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Numair, my father narrated, Ismail ibn Abi Khalid narrated from Abdullah ibn Isa ibn Abdurrahman ibn Abi Layla, from his grandfather, from Ubay ibn Kaab. He said, I was in the mosque, and one man came in and he prayed. He recited in a way that I disapproved of. Then another man came in and recited in a way different from that of his friend. When we finished the prayer, we went together to God's messenger, peace be upon him, and I said, This man recited in a way that I thought wrong, and another man came in and recited in a way different from that of his friend. God's messenger ordered them to recite, and they recited. The prophet commanded their recitations. I experienced some thoughts of denial, but nothing like what it was like before Islam. When God's messenger, peace be upon him, saw what happened to me, he struck me on the chest, and I profusely perspired as if I was beholding God, the mighty and exalted, and I was in terrible fear. He said to me, Ubay, I was given a message to read the Qur'an in one way of pronunciation. I answered him to please make it easier for my community. He came back to me the second time to recite the Qur'an in two ways for my community. I answered him to please make it easier for my community. He came back to me the third time to recite the Qur'an in seven ways of pronunciation. For every time I have given you an answer, you shall have a request to put to me. I said, My Lord, forgive my community. My Lord, forgive my community. I retained the third, keeping it for a day when all creation will come to request of me, even Abraham, peace be upon him. End quote. 
Imam Nawawi gives us a bit of insight in his commentary. Quote, in Hadith number 1626, Ubay ibn Kab mentions that when the Prophet commended the two people's recitations, which were different from what he learned from the Prophet, he experienced some thoughts of denial, but nothing like what it was like before Islam. This means that Satan raised in him some thoughts of denying the prophethood and that this was harder for him than it was before Islam. Prior to becoming a Muslim, he was unaware of the truth or doubtful about it. Now, Satan raised in him thoughts of denying prophethood altogether and this was harder. Commenting on Ubay's statement, Qadi Iyad said, I experienced some thought means that he felt amazed and perplexed and Nothing like what it was before Islam means that Satan raised in him a sort of denial that he did not believe. If such thoughts are not maintained, one is not accountable for them. Al-Mazari said, What this means is that Ubay ibn Kab experienced an unstable situation that was raised by Satan and that it immediately disappeared when the Prophet struck him on the chest and he profusely perspired. The Hadith adds that Ubay said, when God's messenger, peace be upon him, saw what happened to me, he struck me on the chest, and I profusely perspired, as if I was beholding God, the mighty and exalted, and I was in terrible fear. Hadi Iyad said, The Prophet struck him in the chest when he saw that he was experiencing such ill thoughts in order to give him reassurance. End quote. It appears that the event of doubting is being brushed aside or minimized as nothing more than a tempting by Satan. That was then assuaged by revelation that, in fact, the angel Gabriel revealed to Muhammad multiple ways of reciting the Qur'an and Muhammad just didn't tell Ubay until now. And one would have this impression if they restricted themselves to just the English translation provided by Adil Salahi, or if one is an Arabic speaker, did not examine the commentary oneself. There is a part in Arabic at the very end that Adil Salahi did not translate, and he did not do so for a very damning reason, despite that this last part actually tells us what exactly caused Ubay's doubt. Up until now, one would be justified in thinking that Ubay's doubt was because he did not know that there were multiple akhruf, or multiple pronunciations, revealed to Muhammad. That he knew of only one harf, or one pronunciation, and that he initially did not want to accept that there were others. In other words, Satan caused him to doubt that there could be other ways of pronouncing the Qur'an. But that's not actually the real reason Ubay doubted Muhammad's prophethood. Rather, Ubay doubted Muhammad's prophethood specifically because of how the other pronunciations came about. And it has nothing to do with revelation from the angel Gabriel. What this part I have highlighted in red talks about is something related to what's called Irjam, namely how the Arabic script was utilized in early textual manuscripts of the Qur'an. There are two categories of Arabic letters, al huruf al muhmala and al huruf al murajama Basically, the muhmala letters are the basic ground forms of certain letters in the Arabic script. These ground forms are letters in and of themselves, but can also express different letters by the addition of dots. The Mu'ajama letters are those letters that are either built on top of the Muhmala letters and consist of added dots, typically distinguished with red ink in the manuscripts, or, lacking a Muhmala carrier, have a carrier shape among the Mu'ajama group. What Ubay was concerned about was the mixing up in the Qur'anic recitation, the pronunciation of muhmala and murajama letters, which can give rise to totally different lexical meanings. Now, 
in the untranslated portion, the distinction is made between the two letters Dod and Sod. It is unclear from the immediate text whether the Dod Sod distinction was restricted to literally just the letters Dod and Sod, or more likely if the Dod Sod pairing is to be understood as a synecdoche for the entire writing system in general. Whichever is the case is moot, because at this point the notion that the angel Gabriel revealed their various recitations is out the window. Ube realized that the so-called divinely revealed achruf are actually traceable back to written texts and are actually due to deficiencies in the way Arabic was written. In other words, the achruf were not divinely revealed by the angel Gabriel, but came about as the result of different readings of the rasam, that core letter shape that can be altered by the addition of dots. Those who can read Arabic can clearly see that this is the real source of Ubay's doubt. How could Muhammad be a prophet of the true God if he approved different readings of the Qur'an that stem from human misreadings of the deficient Arabic script of that time? This right here is an example of what Yasser Qadi is referring to when he says the standard Islamic narrative has quote-unquote holes in it, namely that Ubay's doubt stemming from hearing multiple akhruf cannot be adequately explained by saying the angel Gabriel revealed the multiple akhruf. Though the immediate context is Ubay's faith while he lived, the domino effect on Muslims in general is now this throws into question the validity of the corresponding hadiths themselves, thereby leaving no explanation of the various akhruf, and also throwing into question the validity of usul al-hadith. The case of Ubay is enough to undermine the entirety of Sunni Islam. Consider the cognitive dissonance. Modern Muslims use the idea of multiple ahruf to reconcile the claim of perfect preservation with the variations we find in Quranic texts. If the matter of ahruf is straightforward to assuage the concerns of uninformed doubting Muslims in the modern era, then why is it the source of doubt for Ubay, who was the best Quran reciter and one of the prominent Sahaba? Why would another haraf cause Ubay to doubt in the prophethood of Muhammad? Such a doubt could get him executed for apostasy, so it must be serious. The doubt about Muhammad's prophethood arose in Ubay because of substantive, non-trivial, contradictory differences among the akhruf that should not exist for a divinely revealed book not to mention that Muhammad allowed a khruf that he himself did not reveal. Imam Nawawi's commentary to Sahih Muslim presents us with evidence that variations in Quranic recitation, i.e. different a khruf, are traced to differences in the written text, which cannot be the case if the angel Gabriel revealed all of the a khruf directly to Muhammad. Think about it. Did Muhammad really need to physically attack Ubay if the whole issue was just a matter of phonetic differences between dialects? It is not reasonable to explain away Ubay's doubt as just a random satanic temptation. Rather, there was something that Ubay specifically given his stature as the best reciter of the Qur'an, could not reconcile with regards to the existence of multiple akhruf and Muhammad's prophethood. Something made the two incompatible. Ubay's doubt in Muhammad's prophethood caused Muhammad to violently attack him. This type of behavior by Muhammad, 
namely physical injury, especially towards someone, Ubay, who has the potential to cause a massive fitna within the Muslim Ummah, thereby resulting in widespread apostasy, is consonant with someone who wants to ensure certain things remain a secret. Now it makes sense why Adil Salahi did not want to translate this part from the Arabic, though understanding what exactly is going on requires a bit technical background knowledge. This part is critically important. It gives us the exact reason that caused Ubay's doubt in Muhammad's prophethood and undermines the entirety of Islam. Despite claiming to be providing the quote-unquote full commentary of Imam Nawawi, we clearly see Adil Salahi does not live up to the claim. Despite being an academic, he's first and foremost a Muslim whose allegiance to Muhammad, the Quran, and Islam trumps any academic expectations. Muslim academics are Muslims first. Do not ever forget that. And now moving on to the last part of this presentation. There is a basic epistemic problem in the Muslim's claim to perfect preservation of the Qur'an. From the Qur'an, Surah 15 verse 9, we are told that Allah will preserve the Qur'an. Now, Allah uses people to preserve the Qur'an. But people are fallible. Since people are fallible, one cannot be 100% certain that the Qur'an has been preserved. Thus, the claim of perfect preservation is not verifiable. The problem can be cast as a dilemma. In order to be 100% certain that the Qur'an is perfectly preserved, one cannot a priori preclude people being immune from error, i.e. people can be infallible since it is through people that the Qur'an is preserved. However, if people are not immune from error, i.e. people are fallible, then you cannot be 100% certain that the Qur'an has been perfectly preserved. In other words, in order to get out of the dilemma, Muslims must claim that there exists an infallible person at every link in the historical chain of transmission and that transmission occurs from one infallible person to another infallible person in order to establish with 100% certainty that the Qur'an has been perfectly preserved. Otherwise, as is the case, since people being fallible is a necessarily imposed condition, one is not justified within the Islamic paradigm to claim perfect preservation. What the Muslim has is an epistemic roadblock that the Qur'an has been perfectly preserved is an unverifiable claim. It is an unprovable assertion. With regards to a potential objection from Muslims, appealing to mass transmission or tawatr by fallible transmitters does not solve the problem. You can't take a bunch of fallible men and achieve the result requiring infallibility. To think that appealing to Tawatur solves the problem is to completely misunderstand the problem in the first place. To recap this presentation on whether the Qur'an has been perfectly preserved, recall that Muhammad himself forgot the Qur'an. If Muhammad could forget the Qur'an, then what makes you think those who are not prophets are immune from the same? Recall the issue of abrogation and that parts of the Qur'an that have not been preserved. We know for a fact that there are verses that were once part of the Qur'an that are no longer present in any copies today. It also does not make sense why the Qur'an would keep some abrogated verses and not others. Recall the seven ahruf and the fact that Muslims themselves do not know what the ahruf even are. Recall Ibn Masud's copy of the Qur'an. Ponder that Uthman destroyed perfectly valid copies of the Qur'an, 
meaning he desecrated what was considered revelation from Allah. Yet Muslims consider him a rightly guided caliph and accept his narrations in the various hadith collections. Recall that Ubay ibn Kab doubted Muhammad's prophethood. Here you have the best Qur'an reciter among the Sahaba who recognized Muhammad as a fraud and was physically assaulted as a result. Recall the epistemic problem with regards to claims of perfect preservation. The claim by Muslims that the Qur'an is perfectly preserved is not verifiable. Even if Muslims could prove the Qur'an was perfectly preserved, it does not logically follow that it was divinely revealed. Thank you for tuning into this episode. Next time on This is Islam, I will discuss the event of Mubahala, the invoking of God's judgment on the erring party, Muslim or Christian. Stay tuned.